welcome everyone. It's really lovely to be here. Bit of a strange experience for me knowing that I'm talking to so many people, but I can't actually see you. But there is a chat room. And so um, if you want to put questions in there throughout, we will hopefully have time to address at least some of them. And um, we've scheduled, you know, we've scheduled an hour for this presentation. Um, I'm happy to go a little bit more if we need to, but I'll try and at least get the content done within an hour so that, um, you know, those of you who do have to go at 12 don't miss any of the content. So um, what I want to start with is first of all, congratulating um, those who put together this fantastic initiative and so well named. Uh, those of you who know about the De Niro know what an extraordinary group of people they were and what they managed to do under such difficult circumstances circumstances. Um, and so I have to mute my phone. I'm muting my phone. I've muted it. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry, this is all a bit new. But um, so you know what they did and you know how extraordinary they were. And it's really wonderful to feel that we're continuing in that tradition of learning and um, of culture and of all kinds of initiatives, um, despite the fact that we can't all be together in one place. So Congratulations to the De Niro team. Welcome to everyone. In order to set the scene for the writer whose work we're going to explore today, we are going to focus mainly on his work, I thought it might be best to show a quick five-minute video that deals with his life and gives you a sense of who he is. Many of you know about Primo Levi already, but you may not know the, the, the details of his biography, his life. And there's a wonderful short film that we found um, in the Yad Vashem archives. And I'm just going to play that now. And hopefully there'll be no technical difficulties. Alas for the dreamer. The moment of consciousness that accompanies, that accompanies the awakening is the acutest, is the acutest of, sufferings. of sufferings, but it does, but it does not, not often happen to us, and they are, and not, they are not long dreams. dreams. We are only, we are only tired, tired beasts. If this, if is, this a is a man. Primo, Primo Levi, was Levi was born in Torino in 1919, in 1919 to, an to an old Italian Jewish, Jewish family. family. After graduating, After graduating from the prestigious, from the prestigious Massimo D'Azeglio School, he began, he began chemistry, chemistry studies at the University, at the University of Turin. Of Turin. During, his, During term his term at the university, the fascist, the fascist regime enacted, enacted race laws, which made it, which difficult, made it difficult for him to complete, him to complete his, studies. his studies, but he eventually, but he eventually graduated, graduated with honors. With honors. Levy and, and several other, other Jewish students founded a, founded a resistance group against, against the fascist, fascist regime. regime. When the, when the Germans took over, took over northern Italy in the autumn of, the autumn of 1943, 1943, following the removal of Mussolini, of Mussolini from, power, from power and the government's, and the government's surrender, to the surrender to the Allies, the group took to the hills where they tried, where they tried to rendezvous with a local anti-fascist underground, underground group. The unskilled, the unskilled members were informed upon and soon, and soon captured, captured in December, in December 1943. 1943. Levy, Levy, who didn't want, who didn't to, be want to be identified as an anti-fascist, anti -fascist, called, himself called himself an Italian, an Italian citizen of Jewish, of Jewish extraction, extraction and was sent and to the Fasoli transit, transit camp near Modena. Near Modena. In, February in February 1944, 1944 the, prisoners the prisoners were sent to Auschwitz. Were sent to Auschwitz. Levy, was Levy was imprisoned in the Auschwitz, Auschwitz camp, camp complex for over 10, for over 10 months. months. Of the, of the 650 Italian, Italian Jews deported, Jews deported with, with Levy, only some, only some 20, 20 survived. Fortunately, Fortunately for him, he knew some he German. Knew some German. He, managed he managed to find work, work in a rubber in factory. factory. And he finally, and he finally fell, fell sick, and so wasn't, and so wasn't taken, on taken on a death march. After the camp, After the camp was liberated at the end of January 1945, Levy returned in a long, a long torturous, torturous journey through Europe Eastern Europe to his home, to his home in Torino. In Torino. He also, he also returned to his job, to his job as, a as a factory chemist and started, and started a family. A family. However, However, alongside, alongside his, daily his daily life, Levy turned, Levy turned to literary, to literary writing, writing, both prose, both prose and, poetry, and poetry, which was impressively, which was impressively powerful. powerful. Levy's, writings Levy's writings are some of the most, of the most honest, sober, and, sober and, human and human expressions of the experience of, the experience of, Auschwitz, of Auschwitz and of the world of the victims and survivors of the Holocaust. 
Levy's first, Levy's book, first book, published in 1947, is entitled, is entitled If This Is, if a, this man, is a Man, his most his direct, direct book, book, which deals, which with, deals the with the experiences of an Auschwitz, of an Auschwitz prisoner, prisoner in a situation in which man's human dignity has been taken, has been taken away, away, and the difference, and the difference between, between human and, human and inhuman, inhuman existence, existence was never, was more, never unclear. more unclear. In his writing, in his writing detailed, detailed, matter of, matter of fact, fact and sensitive, and sensitive but, never but never flowery or sentimental, or sentimental Levy managed to convey a to convey glimpse, of the, glimpse of the world known as Auschwitz. As Auschwitz. Levy also Levy describes, also describes the, constant the constant sense of alienation which every, which prisoner, every prisoner felt. Their names, their names families, families, and, families and, and every connection with their previous lives had been taken, had been away. taken away. This was all the, more, was all the more prevalent among, among the Italian, prisoners, Italian prisoners, who didn't know who German, didn't know or, German Yiddish, or Yiddish, and who were strangers, and who were strangers to, some extent, to some extent, even in the eyes of the other Jews in Auschwitz. Many were the many ways, were the ways devised, devised and put into effect, put into effect by us, by us in, order in order not to die. die. As many as, as, many as there are different human characters, human characters all, implied all implied a weakening struggle of one against all, against all and, a and a by no means small sum of aberrations and compromises. Survive without, without renunciation of any of part of one's own world, moral world, apart from apart powerful, powerful and direct interventions by fortune, was conceded, was conceded only to very few superior, superior individuals made of the stuff of martyrs and saints. If this is a man, wasn't accepted immediately, but in time, its importance and power were recognized. Levy's second book, The Truce, is a product of his experiences as a migrant during the year after his liberation. His famous book, The Periodic Table, is a sort of yeah, literary have, autobiography, which is avoids okay? dealing directly with his time in Auschwitz, but relates to okay. it front and back. His last book was okay. The Drowned and the Saved, in which he returns to Auschwitz um, and ponders not at this the moment, time from a greater the, I've distance, got the, video the big thing on, unsolved I'm... questions concerning okay, the Holocaust. Sorry. <laughs> Levy wrote several other books and collections okay. of stories and poetry, some of which don't deal with the Holocaust at all, at least not directly. Okay. Alongside the okay, piercing, crap, thanks, chilling, God. pessimistic style of oh, if this thanks, is a man, thanks, Levy go. also thanks, reveals God. other sides of his character in his writings, with a veil of wry humor and optimism. Primo Levi fell to his death on April 11th, 1987. Okay, um, so I hope that gave some context. Uh, I realize there's still maybe a, a few technical glitches, but hopefully we're we're on our on our way now and we will go smoothly from here on. So what I'm going to do now is bring up some slides and start that. Okay, so hopefully on your screen now you see an image of Primo Levi and also me in a, in a smaller screen, which is a lot more less intimidating for me, which is great. <laughs> so, okay, so I have to say whenever I do talk on, um, on Levi, I, I do so with a, a feeling of great reverence and great respect and great trepidation. Um, because I do think that his writing, every time I go back to it, is a challenge. It's a challenge um, to read and assimilate the, um, the, the power of it because it is so deceptively clear and almost, I want, it's the wrong word simple, but the clarity of the language is extraordinary and it almost makes you believe that it's a very simple message. And actually, the more you read, the more you realise the layers um, of what he is trying to say. And in many ways, I think, you know, he in, in some of his later writings, he alludes to this. He's always, in a sense, reworking and rewriting this first book, right, if this is a man. And so today, that is the book that we are going to focus on. Um, I did give some selected readings. Don't worry if you didn't get through all of them because I'm going to have slides that are going to point to the most um, important ones. And, um, and so we'll be able to have a sense of, of what he's attempting to do in that work. But I want to, I want to basically do three things today. I want to contextualise Levy's work within the broad scope of, of what's become known as Holocaust literature, really is its own genre now. I then want to talk a little bit about 
um, his, you know, his writing in, in particular and how he views the world of the camps and in particular how he views in, in many ways those who don't survive. And it's that aspect that I then want to link in a sense to my final claim, which I alluded to in my blurb, in, my, in, in the blurb for this session, which is to make a claim for Levy as a Jewish writer. Right? Now, that might sound strange because, of course, he is Jewish, he is a writer, but um, there are those who wrote about the Holocaust from within a very traditional perspective, and then you have everything along the spectrum to those most secular, we might say, of Jews that, that went through this experience and then lived to tell about it. Levy is often placed on that end of the spectrum, right, because he is truly a great secular humanist writer. But today I want to make a claim that he also has a sense and an understanding of Jewish tradition and that what he does in a very significant yet usually overlooked part of the, of the writing, which is the poem that begins the book, he frames his entire view of the camps within an inversion of a traditional Jewish um, idea. And that is the idea of revelation, the idea of Sinai. So it's a big claim. But I hope that you'll stay with me and try and understand Levy through these three um, ideas. So most of my PowerPoint is text. I will try not to make the terrible mistake of reading every bit of it, but the bits that are important I will read out with you and then, and then explain. Okay, so here we go. Now, Alan Mintz, who wrote this, this um, particular quotation, is a scholar of Hebrew literature in general, but also very, very interested in Holocaust literature. And of course, some Holocaust literature is written in Hebrew. Right? Um, and he makes this very interesting claim that often upsets people. So I'm going to read it and then I'm going to hopefully help you understand why it shouldn't upset you, but kind of free you up to think about Holocaust literature in a particular way. So as Mintz says, the Holocaust, like any historical event, has no meaning of its own to divulge. Its meaning, instead of being a discoverable essence, depends on the interpretive traditions of the community or culture seeking that meaning. It is the story of the transcendence of catastrophe rather than of the catastrophe itself, which is compelling. Now, the reason people get upset is that they think, well, what has been saying? He's saying the Holocaust is not important. That is not what he's saying at all. But what he is reminding us and what he's asking us to do is to think about the medium, right? Think about the way the story is told. And through thinking about the way the story is told, it gives us even greater insight into the experience itself. Because, as my next few slides will um, show, Holocaust literature, and I'm going to begin with some of the literature that was um, produced during the period itself, is very much dependent on genre. And sometimes we, unfortunately, in the post-Holocaust era where, let's face it, most Jews um, are not um, sadly able to converse unless they are survivors in the language that often the literature was originally written in, right, um, so the 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 array of European um, languages, and then of course the Jewish languages, Yiddish, Hebrew, etc. Um, we are often reading these in English and we're missing as, as a result, right? We are missing things. That's not gonna stop us, but we should be always keeping that aspect in mind. I'll come to that again a little bit later on. But also what Mintz is trying to get us to understand is the literature itself has a history. Right? It has a history. And so what I want to begin with, and some of these quotations may be um, familiar to you, are a few snippets, right? Now, you, you may not call them literature, but they're snippets from um, an extraordinary archive that many of you may already know about, the Onig Shabbat archive, which was um, a initiative of a group of Jews that had been imprisoned in the Warsaw Ghetto, led by Emanuel Ringelblum, a historian, to try and document what was going on in the ghetto on a daily basis. It was secret. If they were found out, there would be severe consequences. And they buried, they, were, they put it into uh, milk cans and, and uh, steel boxes and buried it underneath the, the, the ghetto. And those few people who survived, who knew where it was, literally went back afterwards and, you know, pointed, like, try here, try here. 
Not all of it has been found, but a great majority has. And what's extraordinary about it, of course, is that it gives us an insight into the, the, the world that was being, that was still going on, even under these most terrible of circumstances. So what I have here is one woman, Gustava Jareka, who was a, a Polish Jewish journalist, right? Um, and she makes this wonderful point, this, this, you know, when you think about the situation that she's in, she's able to, to look beyond what's going on. And she talks about the archive itself. And she, as she says beautifully, this record must be hurled like a stone under history's wheel in order to stop it. Right? Think, about, think about that. Think about us sitting here now having knowledge of what happened in that place, in that time. It's an extraordinary description of, of what she hoped would happen. One can lose all hopes except this one, that the suffering and destruction of this war will make sense when it's looked at from a distant historical perspective, right? Exactly what we're trying to do today. So, so what I want you to start thinking about is what kind of Holocaust literature writing are we looking at? Similarly, Emmanuel Ringelblum himself talks about, and I won't read this all out, but what he's talking about here is his intent. Why is he doing this? Because he wants to tell you about the life of the different Jews that were living in the ghetto at the time, right? What they thought, what they suffered, the, re the religious, the non-religious, right? He, he wants to give as complete a picture of what is going on as possible. And, and even more extraordinary, I think, in terms of what the ghetto writers tried to do, is that they saw their work, right? And this is an interesting thing to think about, and I'll, I'll come to another poem in just a moment that will, uh, impress this I think even more is that they see their experience right both as an experience that they are having as Jews and because they are Jews but that it has a universal message that there is something about this that is significant for the world and that what they are doing is providing information so that the world itself will know what happened in this place okay so it's it's very difficult to find in a sense common threads to any collection of Holocaust literature, because of course you're talking about a, a huge range of diverse individuals and their experience. But if I had to, <laughs> well, I don't have to because David Roskies does it for me. Um, I would say that when we look at the literature of the time, David Roskies, the great Yiddish, uh, Yiddish scholar of Yiddish literature, uh, brother of Ruth Weiss, those of you who also know her incredible work, um, he puts it so beautifully. Our question is, how did they survive? The staff of Onik Shabbos asked, how did they perish? Right? So think about, think about what he's saying there. When we look at this literature, we, in a sense, we, we and, and the experience of the Holocaust overall, we know it and we feel it largely through those the minority, those who were able to survive. And that, of course, makes perfect sense, right? And we are, you know, incredibly, incredibly privileged to have that information. But when we look at something like the Warsaw Ghetto accounts, they wanted to know, they wanted to record what people were trying to do to get through every day to survive. And unfortunately, of course, most of the ghetto writers will not survive. Now, Levy, coming back for a moment to Levy, is a recorder of his own survival. But what we'll see is that he, I think, adds yet another dimension, right? And this is his philosophical, ethical contribution, is he meditates his whole life, right? His whole life on those who did not survive. They are those who preoccupy him and they are those who will feel his, his nightmares. He talks about that in, in other writing, his nightmares. Um, but also his waking moments and trying to understand them and, and the, the trying to find not meaning in a, in a Pollyannaish sense, but to try and understand what it means to live with the knowledge of those who did not survive. Okay. So what uh, that introduction hopefully has got you to think about is how we think about the literature itself is very much to do with the lens that the writer um, is thinking about and is working within. So I've just given a, a few, you know, um, perspectives on how my, one might think about that here. But of course, those of you who have 
read or studied or indeed have family experience of pre-war Jewish life in Europe know that this is the tip of the iceberg in terms of diversity. Right? This was an extraordinarily diverse civilization that stretched from west to east, right? um, north to south of the, of the European continent. And we are dealing with the, with the literary traditions of all of those places, right? all of those languages. Uh, next. Okay. And again, um, I, I, won't, I won't read it, you can read it to yourself, but I think again, this is um, again the great contribution of people like Roskies who have helped us to recognise this and through his own, you know, skills and his own skills as a literary critic, but also his language skills, have been able to bring to us right, the literature of that generation. So if you've, if you've never read any of David Roski's work or his sister Ruth Weiss, go out now and, um, and buy their books or not go out but get them sent to you um, because you, you they will give you such deep insight into the world that these writers came from. Okay, so who was Levy? As you saw in the video, he's a scientist, he's a humanist, and he's often described as a secular, assimilated or acculturated, we might say Jew of Italian heritage. Right? Um, now I say, we might say, because within that last description, a secular, assimilated, acculturated Jew right, are so many shades of grey. At the moment, I'm teaching my third year um, modern Jewish history class at the university, and we've just spent 13 weeks trying to understand what happened to Jewish identity in the modern period, right? Because we are, all of you listening to me today, myself included, we are products of that period. And we often forget that actually to our detriment, right? Because, and, and fair enough, I mean, the events for Jews, the historical events of the 20th century, the Holocaust and the establishment of the State of Israel are so momentous, right? That they, in a sense, they, they block our past. In, in many, many ways. But if you can get yourself back, right, and there are some wonderful historians and writers that you could look at to do so. If you can go back beyond the breach, as, as Ruth Weiss would say, the breach of the Holocaust, what you will find is um, a an, an hybrid of identities that, again, is just impossible almost to do justice to. So when I talk about Levy as a secular, assimilated, acculturated Italian Jew, within that lies 150 years of his family's emancipation in, in Italy, of their struggle to become equal, of their um, need to remain in some way Jewish, right, and what that means to them and how they bring that into their family life. All of those, all of those questions um, come up. And so in many ways, what we forget is we are products of the 19th century, right? We, yes, we, we have the experiences of the 20th century, but in terms of our religious denominations, our cultural traditions, all of these are 19th century experiences. And this is what Levy comes into the war with, with that enormously rich Italian, Jewish, secular, traditional background of hundreds of years of his, of his family's experience, but in particular, the experience of the modern period. So here we're talking really 18th, 19th, 20th century on, and the extraordinary changes that Jews go through as a result of emancipation and enlightenment. So keep that in your, in your mind as well. Okay, now we get to possibly one of my favorite, favorite poems um, uh, from, from a, an Israeli, uh, actually an Israeli poet who was also, um, you know, European background, obviously, Uri Tzvi Greenberg. And this is part of a very, very long poem. Um, but what I think is extraordinary about it is look at the date, right? 1951. 1951, not long after the end of the war at all. And what is he doing here is he's ruminating on what, what, will, what will we think about this disaster? How will we understand it as Jews? How will the world understand it? What does it, what does it mean for us and what does it mean for humanity? And what is extraordinary to my mind about it now sitting, you know, uh, 70 odd years hence, right, in, in the future, is that he, in a sense, was, I mean, you know, I don't generally like to use these words, but prophetic about the impact of the memory of the Holocaust 
um, certainly in Western civilization, I think you can make a debate about how global this memory is, but there, there can be no doubt of the impact of the Holocaust on Western civilization and Western thought. And of course, the key question is, what is the, is there a universality to this, right? And in its universality, do we lose something of the particularity of the experience, right? There's always this tension, right? Always this, this idea at play. And, and for Greenberg to have been sort of come, been able to articulate this in 1951 is absolutely extraordinary. So I do think it's worth reading this one out. So I will, and then, and then we'll move on. Are there analogies to this, a disaster that came at their hands? There are no other analogies. All words are shades of shadow. Therein lies the terrifying phrase, no other analogies. For every cruel torture that man may yet do to a man in, gent in a Gentile country, he who comes to compare will state he was tortured like a Jew. Every fright, every terror, every loneliness, every chagrin, every murmuring, every weeping in the world, he who compares will say, this analogy is of the Jewish kind. Right now, if you start to think about that, right, for both good and bad, this is what has happened to the memory of the Holocaust, right? On the one hand, it is singular. And on the other hand, it is pervasive, right? It is everywhere. Um, you know, I, I could mention a few famous examples, those of you who know the poetry of Sylvia Plath. Right? and that extraordinary moment where she envisions herself as a Jew, right? offensive to some, and, you know, I, I can understand that. But that analogy, right, that pointing towards the experience of the Holocaust and, and in shorthand, in a sense, to Auschwitz or Bergen-Belsen or the camps that have become the epitome of that has given Holocaust literature a sort of, at, at the same time, particularity and universality. And that's sort of, if you like, that's the second major point that I want you to hold in your mind as we now go on and look at Levy's work. So thinking about his background, thinking about the complexity of Holocaust literature and its continued meaning over time, how do we define this work, right? It's, it's actually extraordinarily difficult. Is it history? Sort of. It is sort of history. It's obviously his personal history. It is testimony to an extent. It is a chronicle, right? There are, there are parts of it that read like a chronicle um, of, of his servitude. It is deeply philosophical, right? Deeply philosophical. And at times it, it feels meditative to, to read this work, right? So what I would venture is that what is extraordinary about it is that it resists a definition. Right? It is not simply testimony, it is not simply history, and it is not only philosophy. It is a fusion of so many different forms, and that is partly what makes it so extraordinary. Okay. So now let's look at a few examples that are going to help us try and understand why Levy, why, what is the camp to him? Right? What is he trying to do by looking at the camp and examining it, not, not only its detail, and he gives us extraordinary detail of it, right? but, um, but how he starts to think about the, the universe, the world that the camp creates. And this is a dominant theme in his work, right? What is the world that the camps create? And this is probably one of the most famous um, excerpts from, from If This Is a Man. Levy recounts how, when suffering from thirst, he sees an icicle outside his barrack window and tries to grab it. A Nazi guard knocked it out of his hand. Varum, why? asked Levy. Here is kind Varum. Here there is no why, was the guard's now infamous answer. Levy's words and those of his tormentor confront us with the irrationality of Auschwitz, a sight, a sight that has become synonymous with the worst excesses of the 20th century. So we think, think about that, right? He's he is telling us of an incident. It is an incident that more than likely happened and happened to him, right? But why is he telling it us? It is to give us a sense of the universe he has entered, right? And he's starting to have some understanding of what that universe is, right? Which is it operates on a completely different ethical and moral realm. Indeed, there are no ethics, right? There's an inversion 
of ethics in this universe. There is no rationality, right? And there is certainly no sense of, um, uh, you know, a morality, if you like, or a system of ethics that we would recognize. And so what is the guard, what is Levy trying to tell us through the guard's words, right, is to give us a sense of the immorality, you might say, or the, the unethics or the, the non-ethics of the lager, right, of the camp. Because only if the reader starts to understand that will the reader then be able to enter the world of the prisoner, right, and how the prisoner survives, doesn't survive, the experiences they have. And think back to Alan Mince's opening slide, the meaning, right? This is what Levy's always trying to do, is to bring us to a sense of greater understanding, even though I would venture to say that he would not think that total understanding is possible, right? There's always a sense, I think, when you read Levy, that he too is, is constantly attempting understanding, but never quite getting there. So now I want to go through a few examples, right, um, of, of some of the prisoners that he describes. And he is, what, what's amazing about Leffy's writing, um, and this is noted in the, in the video, is the detail, right, the detail and the clarity. And again, you have to kind of be able to look, I think, within, not, not beneath, but like within the detail to get the, the larger picture, to try and, try and understand what is he doing here in these excerpts. So we're going to go through, through a few of them and then I'm going to venture, if you like, a sort of interpretation of what, what I think Levy is trying to do here. So he talks about Elias, right, one of the prisoners. Elias, the short-statured, unusually physically strong, yet mentally disturbed and unstable prisoner. We witness what it took to remain alive in the concentration camp universe. Elias will be one of the saved. And if you remember, Levy has, he, he divides the prisoners into two, in a sense, two groups, the drowned and the saved. And we'll, we'll say more about that afterwards. And by the way, that was what, that's, as you know, it's the name of one of the chapters. It was the original name he wanted to give to the book, but his publishers um, talked him out of it. So he does eventually write later about it as well. Um, Elias will be one of the saved, not because he obeys, but rather through a peculiar mix of abilities that in the world outside of the lager would have seen him most likely discriminated against, possibly even forced to the margins of society. Yet in the lager, as Levy explains, Elias will be saved because he survived the destruction from the outside because he was physically indestructible. He has resisted annihilation from within because he is insane. Why does such a man survive? Only because in the inverted world of the lager, Levy posits, there are no criminals, nor madmen, no criminals because there is no moral law to contravene, no madmen because we are wholly devoid of free will, as our action is, in time and place, the only conceivable one. So hopefully you can see, I mean, there's so much, there's so much in that excerpt. We could probably spend, you know, the next 10 minutes, but I'm, I'm watching the time as well. Um, but what you see, right, is how Levy is using his experience of this one man who clearly is a very, very disturbed individual, who outside the world of the lager would, would as he said, probably be on the fringes, the margins of society. But inside, he tells you something about the universe that Levy inhabits. And in a sense, he's, I don't mean this in an unkind way, he's a device, right? He's a way that Levy is trying to get us to understand that this world that he's telling us about, this world that he's entered, has completely different rules and completely different um, uh, uh, demands to the world that we lived in outside. But it doesn't mean, it doesn't mean that he can't see those prisoners who try, in a sense, to bring the morality that no longer exists into the world of the camps. And this is Lorenzo, of course. Lorenzo, the ordinary prisoner, who brings Levy extra rations to which he attributes his survival. I believe that it was really due to Lorenzo that I'm alive today. Lorenzo was a man, his humanity was pure and uncontaminated. He was outside this world of negation. Thanks to Lorenzo, I managed not to forget that I myself was there. 
So again, he does, he, you know, in a sense, he he doesn't he doesn't allow us a sort of redemption, if you like. He doesn't allow us a relief of breath. But what he does um, does allow us is to see that there is the possibility for humanity, even within the situation that he finds himself. And then, of course, one has to think, well, what? Why? Why is he telling us uh, about this? What is this about? Right? And he he says himself, and I want to be really clear here. He's not trying to predict who will live and who will die. That, that's a futile uh, kind of idea, in a sense, in, in the camps, right? And he says it very explicitly here. In short, they were saved by luck. And there is not much sense in trying to find something common to all their destinies beyond perhaps their initial good health, right? So the point, what, I, what I'm positing here, right, the point of observation for Levy is not to search for a common reason for a particular individual's survival, but rather to understand how the specifics of that survival sheds light on the inverted ethical universe of the camp. And from this vantage point to try and articulate the implications of the concentration camp for a new understanding of ethics. Now, this might sound paradoxical, and it is. Right? So what he is doing is he is saying, here is this world without morality, and I am going to take it and present to you a new morality, right? a new way of being. Now, again, sounds paradoxical, but this has always struck me as one of the most extraordinary things about the, the majority, and I won't say all, and, and fair enough, because every survivor has their experience and their reaction to their experience. But when I think about particularly, you know, many of you know I worked for many years at the Jewish Museum and I still have a very strong connection to it. What I always found extraordinary about the survivors was that given their experiences, what they should have done, really, logically, when you think about it, is turn away from the world, right? Is say, enough, right? I'm not, I'm not going there. That that they have seen the worst. And yet, what do they do? <laughs> they build museums, they build schools, they build educational institutions, and they say, no, let's use this experience to do something good, right? <laughs> to do something better. Now, I think Levy has the same impulse. I think I'm not sure he's giving the same message. And I and that's where we're going now. Okay. I think there is something very, very painful about the message that that Levy is giving, and it's not simply a, you know, darkness to light. I, I don't want to posit that for a second. Um, but but he's still doing something extraordinary in taking this world of negation, as he calls it, this world of negation, right, and, and seeking something out of it. Okay. Okay. Um, so who does he seek it from? The Muslimana. Right? Those who are already dead. These are the people that, and this is these. This is the name given um, by prisoners themselves to those prisoners. Excuse me, sorry, a bit of a runny nose. <laughs> um, no COVID, promise. Um, they, 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 these these prisoners who, in a sense, have already um, given up is you know such a facile phrase to use. But those who are living but dead. Right and and understandably so, and there's the, the if you haven't read it, I, I gave this to you in the in the um, in the handouts. Read the Canto of Ulysses. It's it's extraordinary. It's extraordinary. It's about an episode where Levy is is sent to to basically to get food with a young prisoner, a French uh, prisoner, and he he gets this drive to to speak about literature with him and to speak about Dante's Inferno and to try and explain it to him and in and of itself it's a sort of extraordinary episode but what you realize as well is that he's telling that he's telling his their story he's telling their story and you don't have to be an expert on Dante I certainly am not um, to understand what's going on here but in the canto basically uh, they do die it's different from the original American story right they do and um and at the end of of the chapter the levy recounts the part in the canto where the water comes over their heads right and the, as it says here and the ocean closed over our heads but the ocean of course in levy's recounting is the lager and those who drown the drowned remember this the the you know um of the lager are the are the musulmana Right. And these are the people that Levy cannot forget. They are the ones that will haunt him day and night. Okay. 
Now my claim for Levy as a Jewish writer. Little bit of, little bit of um, uh, theology for the day, okay? The Shema. Most of you, I have no doubt, know it. Um, or if you don't know it, you know of it, right? Um, it's one of the most important prayers in, in Judaism. It's uh, recited by observant Jews twice daily. Um, the first word, the Shema, right here, is, is generally translated as here. Not a great translation, right? It should be more like, you know, listen, get it, understand it, Israel, right? There is a, there is one God. There is a singular God, right? And um, this prayer, right? And here you have to trust me. This is this has been this has been argued about by theologians and academics and etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera, right? But this prayer is understood as the rabbinic reaffirmation of the Sinai moment, right? That every day the observant Jew must reattach him or herself to the covenant, to the Sinai moment, and that is done through the recitation of this prayer, right? Remember that God is one and you are in covenant to this God. You are in relationship with this God. This is the prayer that Levi rewrites Right? And think about the moment of revelation in Jewish history, the way we think about it, what it means for us as a people, religious, non-religious, what Sinai meant, right? Forges us as a people and a people in relationship to God and a people who believe in a revealed law that, that tells you something about the way you should live, right? I mean, when you think about it, it's kind of as simple and complex as that, right? That's what Jewish theology is. Understands or do something and understand that you must live in a particular way as a result. Right, that's that's what it is. So it's an enormously um, powerful idea within Jewish life and thought, and it is this prayer that, in a sense, encapsulates it most succinctly um, and most regularly. Right, if you think think about the the ideas of observance and why one does this, right, is to constantly hammer into yourself, right, <laughs> what you're meant to be thinking about. Okay, so what does Levy do? He rewrites this poem. And he and they place it at the beginning. He and and as I understand it, this is this is a decision um, between him and his publishers. Although I, I can't seem to get any absolute affirmation on that, but I'm still trying to. Um, right? They place it at the beginning. This frames the book, right? You you read this at the beginning of the book. And I'm gonna gonna go through it with you, and in a sense, try and understand if the Shema is revelation, if the Shema is Sinai. What is Levi Shema? Right? What is his revelation? What is his understanding of the camps of the people that we just looked at, of the of the incredibly detailed description he gives us of the experience of Auschwitz? What is the meaning he's seeking? So, as he writes, you who live in who live safe in your warm houses, you who find returning in the evening hot food and friendly faces, consider if this is a man who works in the mud, who does not know peace, who fights for a scrap of bread, who dies because of a yes or no. Sorry, I think sometimes, even now, I've read this poem a million times and I, it still really deeply affects me. Um, sorry, <laughs> consider, consider if this is a woman without hair and without a name, with no more strength to remember, her eyes empty and her womb cold, like a frog in winter. Meditate. That this came about. I commend these words to you. And then we go into the, to what I put here, the terms of the new covenant. That's my writing. Now, Levy, carve them in your hearts, at home, in the street, going to bed, rising, repeat them to your children, right? Those of you who know the Shema, you can hear the cadence, right? Um, on, the, on the doorposts of your house, right in your gates right you can you can hear it he knows the prayer right the punishment for not fulfilling the terms of the covenant right and and here you have to think back as well right to the shema the shema is is classic covenantal theology right you do this i do this now i don't want to simplify that covenantal theology but there are terms of agreement between the israelites and god right and and each one is meant to fulfill their roles as a result of, of agreeing to this covenant, to this sacred contract. So what is the punishment if, if you do not, right? And this is what Levy's going into here. Or may your house fall apart, may illness impede you, may your children turn their faces from you. 
So it's a pretty, it's a pretty extraordinary poem, just in and of itself, but it frames the entire book. So what is it? Well, what I'm going to argue, what I'm going to posit is that this is a revelation, right? Levy does understand the camp as a revelation, but it's a revelation not predicated on redemption of the experience, you know, from the experience of Auschwitz, but as a result of direct confrontation with it. And here, I'm not trying to in any way uh, dissuade people of their own beliefs, so don't, don't get me wrong, but I see Levy as saying, Auschwitz is actually the ultimate negation of traditional Jewish belief. Now, I'm not saying it's the ultimate negation of Jewish thought or Jewish philosophy to, to Levy. I'm not saying that at all, right? But he's saying a new covenant must be forged in the face of Auschwitz. And this is what he's, he's trying to get us to think about here. And probably the best example in the book, I think, is part of the chapter I gave you called October 1944, which is excruciating. I have to say it's, it's excruciating chapter to read, but it's the chapter where they go through selection. And as they come back to the barracks, Levy sees uh, Kuhn, one of the, the prisoners who is, who is religious, thanking God that he has not been chosen. And I'll, I'll start from the, the, the second paragraph there because I think it gives you a sense of, of what Levy's thinking when he, when he witnesses this, right, what it tells you. Kuhn is out of his senses. Does he not see Beppo the Greek in the bunk next to him? Beppo, who's 20 years old and is going to the gas chamber the day after tomorrow and knows it and lies there looking fixedly at the light without saying anything and without even thinking anymore? Can Kuhn fail to realise that next time it will be his turn? Does Kuhn not understand that what has happened today is an abomination, which no proprietary prayer, no pardon, no expiation by the guilty, which nothing at all in the power of man can ever clean again? If I was God, I would spit at Kuhn's prayer. So he does, he does not mince his words, right? Um, Levy is challenging, if you like, all of our traditional faith systems. And again, I don't mean, I just want to underscore, I'm not saying this to, to go other way in terms of, um, you know, my opinion on this. I'm just trying to help you understand what he's doing in terms of traditional Jewish thought here. So oftentimes this, um, or oftentimes, this has been described, this kind of experience, the idea of a, a direct confrontation with with some with with Auschwitz and with the Holocaust as, if you like, um, the negation of um, of a moral universe, has been described by other writers as well as what they call a negative epiphany, a negative revelation, right? And I think Susan Sontag's um, wonderful description. I mean, it's just it's still one of the best descriptions I think I've ever read. Um, of her own experience of this really brings home what, again, what Levy's trying to do. So I will, I will read this one as well, so forgive me. Um, this is from her very famous essay um, book on photography. One's first encounter with the photographic inventory of ultimate horror is a kind of revelation, the prototypically modern revelation, a negative epiphany. For me, it was the photographs of Bergen-Belsen and Dakar which I came across by chance in a bookstore in Santa Monica in July 1945. Nothing I have seen in photographs or in real life ever cut me as sharply, deeply, instantaneously. Indeed, it seems plausible to me to divide my life into two parts. Before I saw those photographs, I was 12 and after, though it was several years before I understood fully what they were about. What good was served by seeing them? They were only photographs of an event I had scarcely heard of and could do nothing to affect, of suffering I could hardly imagine and could do nothing to relieve. When I looked at those photographs, something broke. Some limit had been reached, and not only that of horror. I felt irrevocably grieved, wounded, but a part of my feelings started to tighten. Something went dead. Something is still crying. And this idea, right, this idea that that time changes. This is actually a deep, this is a very old idea, by the way, it's a very, very old idea. Um, it's a, and it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a deeply theological idea. 
And if you look at ancient Jewish texts and and even, you know, what we would call, uh, you know, nascent Christianity, the early Christians who, of course, were Jews, this is how they saw the moment of revelation. Time changes, right? So for the for for ancient Israelites, the moment of Sinai is a time is is a moment where everything changes, right? Where we we where the, the in in a sense experience um, completely transforms in light of the revelation. For early Christians, of course, that that is reinterpreted particularly by Paul, of course, as the, the coming of through the coming of Jesus. But this idea that somehow an event, an event, is experienced, is seen, is witnessed and everything changes. And this is what Levy, I think, is also trying to get at in terms of his meditation on the drowned, those that do not survive. And it's interesting because he, again, he he makes the point um, about it as a as sacred text, right? Like he, he actually uses those words, all our stories, hundreds of thousands of stories, all different, all full of a tragic, disturbing necessity. We tell them to each other in the evening. They take place in Norway, Italy, Algeria, the Ukraine, and are simple and incomprehensible, like the stories of the Bible. But are they not themselves stories of a new Bible? And finally, the, the Muslim man, right? And, and I, I uh, referred to this before, and I realise I'm going to run out of time very soon. So, um, but I think it is important to, to have a sense of how he thinks about these people because they are what he is looking at, what he wants you to look at when he says in the Shema, do not turn your faces. It is the Muslim that he wants you to see. It is not actually the survivors, right? It is not them, as he says, right? We, the, the survivors are not the true witnesses. We are those who by their prev prevarications or abilities or good luck did not touch bottom. Those who did so, those who saw the Gorgon, have not returned to tell about it or have returned mute, but they are the Muslims, the submerged, the complete witnesses. We who were favoured by fate try, with more or less wisdom, to recount not only our fate, but also that of others, indeed, of the drowned. We speak in their stead by proxy. And the first half, which I think really is his haunting, right? His haunting, that's what he's describing here. They crowd my memory with their faceless presences. And if I could enclose all the evil of our time in one image, I would choose this image, which is familiar to me, an emaciated man with head dropped and shoulders curved on whose face and in whose eyes not a trace of thought is to be seen. So what finally, this is the final bit, I promise, right? Um, what does Levy's new covenant, what does this negative epiphany, this new revelation, the drowned, facing the, the drowned, what does it require? Now, I'm just going to give a few thoughts here. This is by no means comprehensive and hopefully actually what this has done is to allow you to think about um, what you think, I guess, um, the, the drowned, who are the drowned and what, what do they demand of us, right? If you think about it, it always, it always strikes me, right? Like they, Levy, I think, truly believes they demand something of us, right? They, they, it is them. And I think, you know, think about it, right? It's not the perpetrator. But this is the also remarkable thing. They are almost absent, right, from, from Levy's world. Of course, they are there. They are the reason that they are there. But it's the, but the ethical demand, if you like, or the the meaning that that Levy is seeking comes from the victim, right? Comes comes from the victim, um, and this is you know this is a sort of extraordinary thing, right? So um, so here it's just I offer these as a few ideas, a position of what I've called aporetic mourning. Now, what is an aporia? It's almost like an impasse, right? It's something that you can't get past, and I think I actually. The more I read Levy, the more I think this is what he wants us to understand the Muslimana as, is actually a necessary, not, not a block to understanding in the sense that we must give up, but rather a impetus to understanding that keeps coming back again and again and again. And that if we do not, if we, in fact, if we do get past, we have missed the point, right? We have missed the point. 
that actually we have to have that image in front of us in a sense all the time and and there's another beautiful phrase that um that i that i found in other you know writing about you know the the idea that he is inconsolable before history right that we actually must resist closing this history we must resist redeeming it right because actually what this history gives us is a sense of um it 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 must shake us continuously, right? And why must it shake us? Because then it generates, if you like, a, a sort of ethical obligation upon us for Levy, right? That that when we look at the face of the Muslim man, we see what we have to do, right? We don't see ourselves as them. This is, you know, not, it's not about some kind of false empathy. Um, it's not, there's not even a possibility, right? Think about what he says even about himself. We are not the drowned, right? We are those who manage to actually not hit bottom, but we do stand in their stead, right? And we have to, in some way, try and come to terms with, with their loss right? and what it means for us. And here, I think he is in some ways, right? Although, of course, Levinas is for, first and foremost a philosopher, right? Um, but he, he, in some ways, it relates across to what we might call a Lev, Levinasian reading. Right, of ethics. Um, some of you may have read Emmanuel Levinas, also a survivor, an extraordinary um, philosopher of the 20th century. And Levinas posits something that he calls ethics as first philosophy, or in, in other words, philosophy is no longer post the Holocaust, it's not about the rational self, because the rational self led us to Auschwitz, right? It's not about that. It's rather about ethics as you know sounds called ethics as optics the, the fact that we must see the face of the of the other as levinas calls it um but really the face of the victim right the face of the the one that doesn't um, survive and that is where our ethics begins and is the obligation that that loss places on us right is where levy i think i believe brings us okay I'll stop there. <laughs> it is exactly 12 o'clock, which is some kind of minor miracle. Um, but I'll um I'll stop there. I know that's that's quite a bit to have gone through in an hour. Um I guess I'll I, I know that some people will have to leave and please feel free. I'll now try and find where there might be questions and I'll see if I can um answer them. Okay. So um, so perhaps we'll do about sort of, you know, 10, 15 minutes of questions and, and then I'll, I'll let people go. So, um, okay, so Sarita's answered um, some of this. The, there are, oh, okay, Sarita's highlighted some of them. Okay, excellent. Uh, I've just got to find, this is, okay, great. Okay. Oh, oh, okay. I think I'm going the wrong direction. Okay, okay. So I've got um got a question here. Is it an argument to understand the suffering of war, or arguing that the experience of war is entirely nonsensical for those who experience it? That is a that is a really interesting question. Thank you, Mark. Hi, Mark. Mark's one of my ex students. Um, so, um, and that is a really excellent question. I think it is more. I don't think it is nonsensical. No. No, I don't think so. I think that um, for Levy, it, it is um, it is absolutely and deadly serious. First of all, obviously, right? I mean, I think we can say obviously, but I think what you're pointing towards is a sort of um, an acceptance of the irrationality. But actually, I think it's slightly different. I think what Levy is saying is that this is deeply rational in a way, right? If you know, think about where he comes from. He's coming from a, uh, this this incredibly sort of you know enlightened upper class. He's very educated. He's extraordinarily bright, scientific humanist, right? This is where we have to remember he is a scientific humanist, and um, and I think what he is trying to understand is how did the rational world create this, right? Auschwitz is a creation of the rational world. Right? The world of the Enlightenment, the world of, of, of Europe that we felt we were progressing right, towards something better and better and better. And by the way, he's not, of course, the only Holocaust thinker um, to have this kind of idea. And, and some of them, of course, can't, cannot bear, well, we assume they cannot bear to live in, in a post-Holocaust world because of this, because of the sense that the, the, um, the failure of the Enlightenment, really, the failure of rational thought, 
that the Holocaust demonstrates. So people like, you know, like Benjamin, right? Walter Benjamin, who we, we can only speculate as to his why why he suicides, but there is a sense, right, that he has lost complete faith in European culture. So this is a very long way of saying, Mark, <laughs> and you're probably used to this from my from my teaching, um, that I, I don't think it's nonsensical um, for Levy in his in his uh, response. But I also realise that in your question, you're asking, do, do they experience it that way? And I think that's well, that's a that is a, definitely a question for another lecture. Too too difficult. So, but we'll we can talk about it. Okay, so I'll try and find the others now. Um, there's been a few technical questions that Sarita answered. Um, do, 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 do. Uh, okay. Yes. Ah, oh, that's a thank you, Jody. Jody's written something I think very, very beautiful here. To some of us, the drowned are our lost families. Whether we have photos or not, we still see them. I think that's so true. Um, you just made me think of the children's memorial in in the um, in the museum. I think that's very true. Very true. Um, okay. Oh, and we've got a recommendation from Bettina. Um, thanks, Bettina. There's a, a film, The Truce, based on um, Primo Levi's book, The Truce, directed by Francesco Rossi. Okay. Um, I, don't, I don't think I'm seeing any more questions. And uh, Sarita, am I missing any? <laughs> I'll wait and see if Sarita tells me, but I don't think so. So, so look, I'll, I will leave it there. I will leave it there. Thank you all for joining me. I'm so sorry I can't actually see you, but I'm really, really like honoured that so many people tuned in and um, and it's been a pleasure and enjoy um, the rest of the Denira sessions as much as you can and everyone keep well, safe um, and Shabbat Shalom. <laughs>